Aloha, I'm State Representative Cindy Evans and I represent on the Big Island, North Kona, South Kohala. Thanks for being with me today and today we're going to talk about Hawaii invasive species and I have Josh Atwood who's the coordinator of the Hawaii uh, Invasive Species Council. Hi. Yes. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. You know, at the legislature, we're always talking about invasive species. And as you just mentioned before we started this show, uh, there's this bill on brown tree snake, which is just one of many bills and many um, initiatives that we're hearing about this session. And I think with this time that we have, this session, I think we'll talk about different initiatives, different bills. Um, but before we get started, I think the audience would love to know more about the Invasive Species Council and, and about you. Sure. All right. Um, so the Invasive Species Council was created by statute in 2003. Uh, it originally came through as Senate Bill 1505, um, which includes some of my favorite uh, language from a preamble ever, which is that um, the legislature finds that the silent invasion of uh, Hawaii by invasive species is the single greatest threat to uh, Hawaii's economy uh, and lifestyle and the well-being of its citizens. Um, so from that Senate bill uh, came chapter uh, 194 of the Hawaii Revised Statutes, which establishes the council and dictates uh, who is part of it. So the council is designed to be an interagency group that's composed of uh, six state departments that are voting members, including uh, the Department of Land and Natural Resources, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Health, Department of Transportation, Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, and the University of Hawaii. Uh, in addition to those six voting members, there are a number of state departments that uh, participate in discussions so that they can have a voice as well. Um, so we have the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, uh, Department of Defense, and uh, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, as well as um, eight uh, state legislators. There's a senator and a representative from each county that participates uh, in our meetings or is invited to come to all of our discussions. So it's a great group for um, bringing together different state departments to discuss an issue that is so pervasive that it doesn't affect just one area of life. It's not, invasive species couldn't be addressed just by DLNR uh, or just by DOA. It's um, such a broad impacting issue that all those departments have to come together to discuss it. So it's a great idea and it's been functioning now for uh, eight years. Uh, we have some really good participation. How did you get involved personally? I mean, it's always nice to know the person that's, I mean, your passion. Tell us a little about you. Sure. Um, so my background is that uh, I'm from Maine originally, um, but uh, I love Hawaii since the first time I came here in 2004. I was working with a national organization that did community service programs. So I led this um, Hawaii-themed community service program where students uh, in high school from around the country would come to Hawaii and participate. Um, in field work, including invasive species control. Um, so that was my first brush um, with the conservation community in Hawaii. I came back with the same company to lead another trip in 2006, uh, and then I went into graduate school um, to get a doctorate in um, biology and environmental science. Part of my uh, graduate experience included a funded externship to do work uh, outside of um, my graduate school, which was um, in Rhode Island. And so I used that opportunity to work with the Bishop Museum here in Honolulu and um, the Oahu Invasive Species Committee. Um, the uh, Oahu Invasive Species Committee, or OISC, partners with the Bishop Museum on a project called Oahu Early Detection. Um, and they um, are a group that assesses um, incipient plant species, ones that aren't well established yet but have the potential to become invasive. And so what they were working on was a multi-year uh, roadside survey to identify and then um, plot geographically where these potentially harmful plant species were. So I came out and worked with that group uh, for four months and sort of learned about what issues they were dealing with uh, and did some outreach work for them in the conservation community. And that was the first time that I heard of the Hawaii Invasive Species Council. So after that internship was over, I went back to the East Coast um, but it was really just a matter of time until I finished because I knew that I wanted to come right back here and work. So luckily for me, um, when I finished my degree, um, this position coordinating the council was open uh, and I came right back to work here. Well, it sounds like you have a wonderful background for it, but I think more important is the stories about there's a lot of jobs and potential uh, 
opportunities in conservation, natural resource management. Um, what is your take on, you know, I mean, a lot of people are watching the show and they maybe have nieces, nephews, children. I mean, there must be opportunity. Do you see this field, a growing field, an area that we should encourage our children to consider? Most definitely. Um, it's a field that I think when times are tough economically, um, the opportunities shrink um, as they would in any field. But um, because Hawaii is uniquely um, sensitive to environmental concerns like invasive species, um, there will always be jobs here that are focused on protecting Hawaii's environment. And so I think that it's a field that um, as we're faced with more issues and as the economy recovers, it's definitely um, an area where I would hope to see more job growth and more people getting involved. So for people who are wondering, you know, what fields um, their children should go into, yeah, I would say environmental concerns is a great place to put your energy. Mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. definitely need the help. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this Invasive Species Council is administratively attached to our State Department of Land and Natural Resources. That's right. So even though it's an interagency group, um, it has to be housed within one department or another for administrative purposes. So I sit within the Division of Forestry and Wildlife at the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Mm -hmm. Have you found um, that you're getting a lot of what would we call it, momentum this session on issues surrounding invasive species? Are you a little concerned that there's a few out there that are really gaining ground and, you know, if we don't intervene now that by the time we intervene it is too late? Yes, there are definitely some species that I think are out there gaining ground and they're at that critical point um, that Koki Frog on the Big Island might have been at, say, 10 years ago, where you have this opportunity with a small isolated um, population or set of populations that you could deal with, um, but if you lose that opportunity to act, then the species becomes more established and um, control and eradication become more costly and um, less likely to succeed. So there are a few that uh, are at that point now, including axis deer on the Big Island. Um, that's a recent discovery that um, axis deer have been moved from um, Maui and Molokai over to the Big Island, and there are um, populations there that we're hoping can be controlled beca before it becomes um, established there. So I think that that has spawned um, some action this legislative session, including a bill from Senator Kahele that would put additional um, restrictions um, on Oh yes, so this here is an, uh, a photo of an axis deer on the Big Island. This is some of the first evidence actually um, that we have um, that shows concretely that there are deer there. Um, this is taken with a motion camera um, and so the deer are um, very skittish as a species and so they're hard to um, track down and document. So um, having motion cameras set up without people there accompanying them is a great way to document their presence. So this is one of the f first photos of axis deer that we have um, and from here we're hoping that we can um, start to monitor where the populations are and then put together a successful management plan. Mm -hmm. And why? Why? I mean obviously axis deer is hunters, it could be a game sport, but mm -hmm. What, what did they do to the environment that we have to be worried about? So axis deer are actually um, classified as a game mammal on certain other islands like Maui and Molokai. People hunt them uh, and use them for meat. Um, and the Department of Land and Natural Resources um, works with hunters to um, try to control those populations at a manageable size. But on the Big Island, where um, that species was not present before, um, there are a host of environmental issues that would be new to that area. Um, deer are ungulates uh, or hooved animals and so like feral goats or feral pigs um, the problem that they pose for the environment is that their uh, hooves tend to disturb the uh, upper la layer of soil um, so there's um, they browse plants back and then um, native plants have trouble regenerating because the soil is disturbed so I think actually I brought an image today um, that shows the difference between um, a fenced area uh, and a non-fenced area and the damage that ungulates can do. Um, basically when you have an area that's free of ungulates you have a healthy native forest um, that's regenerating um, and if there are ungulates in that area then the plants aren't able to grow um, back after disturbance um, and if anything um, disturbance tends to favor fast-growing uh, invasive weeds and so they can actually um, promote the growth of um, 
non-desirable plants. Mm -hmm. So ungulates are hoofed animals, and we have what the pigs. Mm -hmm. The we even have. Um, don't we have cattle that that are wild that might be out there? Yeah, um, I think that's um, you know in terms of numbers less of an issue. But um, yeah, cattle are you know definitely a species that can cause um, issues if they're outside of uh, agricultural areas. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have the goats, mm -hmm. which is a big issue. At least right. on the Big Island where I'm at, we have a lot of goats as well as turkeys <laughs> everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, and mouflon sheep as well, uh, that's another species that um, is present in large numbers and um, disturbs soil because of its mm -hmm. hooves. Mm -hmm. So does your council work with hunters? Do you work with uh, ranchers? Do you, I mean, obviously from what you've said with the Department of Defense, that's a huge landowner or someone who controls a large piece of land. So they need to be at the table mm -hmm. because they're land managers. So I can see why they would be there. Right. Um, but what about the, the bigger ranching and cattle and, and the landowners around the state? Where do yeah. they play in on this discussion? They would certainly be welcome to participate yeah. in our discussions. I think historically we have not had um, a lot of interaction with the hunting community, um, perhaps because our meetings have been um, focused in Honolulu where the council members are working. Um, it's difficult for us to um, interact on a face-to-face -face basis with um, the hunting community across the state. Um, so one of the things that we're hoping to do in the near future is um, have a council meeting that's outside of Honolulu. Um, hopefully later this year we're going to have a meeting on Maui specifically to uh, work with the Maui County Council um, and to um, engage with the Maui community to talk about access deer on Maui. Um, there, uh, it's an issue of not eradication necessarily because there are so many deer on Maui, but instead um, trying to find a long-term management plan that would keep them at um, a population size that um, allows us to minimize negative impacts such as um, deer crossing roads and causing accidents um, or causing uh, large-scale agricultural damage. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads me to ask, as a policymaker, you know, we're talking about the council being attached to the Department of Land and Natural Resources, the Division of Forest and Wildlife. And yet, at each county level, they have their own specific issues. But when it comes to really tackling the problems, does it need to be done at the community level? If it has to be done at the community level, where does the state really, what responsibility do they have, or should we be engaging more with county government, the council, and saying, we know you got a problem, but it's close to home, and you know, come on, you know, county, we need to, you know, have you step up to some leadership position, but where's the, what's the relation between the county and the state? Because, you know, if you just say the county would say, well, it's a problem, but we're gonna wait for the state to solve it, well, you know, we have very limited resources, Mm -hmm. That's a very difficult thing. So tell me a little bit about these dynamics between, you know, the state and the county and, and, and how do we do it at the local level? Right. Yeah, the relationship between the counties and the state uh, obviously has to be a positive one um, for invasive species efforts to succeed. And I think Maui County provides a really excellent example of that. Um, the initiative to put together a long-term management plan for access deer on Maui was initiated um, not by the Invasive Species Council at the state level, but by um, the Maui County Council. And then um, they submitted a request to the statewide Invasive Species Council to provide some assistance in developing that plan. So that's a process that we're working on now. Um, and we have representation from the Maui County Council um, at Invasive Species Council meetings. Uh, and also within um, the Invasive Species Council has four working groups that uh, are comprised of members of the public and conservation organizations. And the Maui County Council has been um, interacting with those working groups as well. So we would like to see a better relationship uh, with the counties um, outside of Maui, but I think that provides a really good example of what that relationship could look like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let's move on to a couple invasive species. Sure. All right, so what one do you want to tackle first? Do you want to tackle plants or animals? Um, let's talk about animals. So I brought some examples um, of species that were um, particular problems on the Big Island. Um, the Big Island um, is faced with some of the worst um, problems for invasive species. Um, they are 
um, by far the island that has the most widespread little fire ant, uh, which I brought a photo of today. Um, the little fire ant is a species of ant that's um, incredibly tiny. Um, the ants are about a sixteenth of an inch long. And the problem with little fire ants is that they have really large colony sizes and they have the ability to become the uh, dominant species in almost any kind of habitat. So whether it's an urban environment, um, an agricultural land, um, or a natural area, these ants can um, dominate the landscape. Um, they have severe negative impacts on humans in that they have this very powerful sting that's coordinated amongst the ants. So um, the ants will not sting you at first. They'll sort of cluster onto the skin and then through the release of a pheromone chemical um, coordinate a timed uh, release of their sting, which can be really powerful. So it's definitely a species that you don't want in your home um, and something that you don't want in your yard if you have animals in the yard or kids um, playing outside. So there's some real negative impacts there. Um, also for wildlife um, that can be stung by these um, ants, um, you know, that's a negative impact on them as well. So it's a species that is very hard to eradicate once it's, it's established. Um, so on the Big Island, again, um, along the Hamakua coast at least, it's at a stage where they're not talking necessarily about eradication, but rather management and trying to keep it from spreading. Um, it's also been detected on the Kona side of the Big Island. Um, there was a population on Maui um, that was pretty persistent, but the um, Hawaii Department of Agriculture um, sponsors a Hawaii Ant Lab program um, that is specialized to deal with these sorts of cases. And then we also have um, the Maui Invasive Species Committee. So those groups, uh, along with some others, have been tackling um, the problem on Maui. and. Um, I believe that they have eradicated the uh, local infestation of um, little fire ants there because they caught it early, um, knew what to look for, and were prepared to respond to it. Um, on Kauai, there's one location that has had a persistent infestation of little fire ant for about 10 years now, um, and the issue there is access for control and also having um, the funding and permitting in place to respond to the infestation. So far, um, groups on Kauai have been successful in keeping it from spreading to other areas, um, but uh, the population still exists there. And so it's something that we have to monitor um, and hope that it doesn't spread before um, we have the opportunity to really respond to it and hopefully um, eradicate it on that island. Now the permitting part, mm -hmm. let's talk about that. that. That's the ability to go on private land with or without the owner's permission? Um, well, that's part of it. I mean, uh, I think that these groups that do control work always want to work with landowners uh, and obtain permission before going onto property. Um, so there's permits for access, but then also permits for uh, pesticide use. So there are um, a lot of products that are um, developed very creatively by the conservation community um, to address these concerns, but they have to be permitted for use before we can put them um, out into the environment. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's another area where um, that's something that can hold up um, projects uh, in responding to new threats of invasive species. Mm -hmm. So um, how does the homeowner know if they have them? Is this where you put peanut butter on a stick? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I think I remember this, but how, did, how does anybody that's watching today, if they want to know? Sure. Um, there was actually a program on uh, Maui for a while where um, school kids were taking home um, jars and then they would um, have chopsticks with peanut butter on them. You put it out in the yard for um, half an hour or so and then you um, take the sample, put it in a bag, and then you would um, take it back to school and give it to a scientist who would ID whatever ant species um, had come to your chopsticks. And so that was a great way that they involved um, kids uh, in education and community monitoring for that mm -hmm. species. Mm -hmm. But that method is also used by the Department of Agriculture or the Hawaii Ant Lab for detecting um, ant species in cargo containers or shipments of plants that might go into island. So mm -hmm. yeah, peanut butter is a great attractant. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the reasons I love this show is because I learned so much. And when you said Hawaii Ant Lab, I have never heard of the Hawaii Ant Lab. What is this? So they're actually a really interesting group. Um, they are based out of Hilo, uh, and they're funded um, partially through the Department of Agriculture, partially through the Hawaiian Invasive Species Council. We have an annual budget that we use to fund projects such as the Hawaii Ant Lab, uh, and they have some other funding sources as well. But um, basically, it's an expert entomologist and um, some support staff uh, 
that do research on ants, um, do research on eradication methods, and they also try to develop uh, response tools that can be used to manage infestations. So they've invented some really creative um, ways of deploying um, pesticides and attractants um, that try to um, control infestations. So they have something um, called the spackler of death, which is basically a paint spackler that's used to project um, an attractant bait and also a pesticide into um, tree areas that you wouldn't be able to reach otherwise. Um, one of the problems with a little fire ant is that it's an arboreal ant species, so it can exist not only on the ground, but it can make um, nests and colonies that are um, living up in the tops of trees. So it can be really difficult to control if you don't have a way to get um, pesticides um, up into um, tree branches where they might be living. Ooh, and when you're a little kid and want to, you know, crawl up the trees, I used to do that. Ooh, you might get into some ants. Exactly, yeah. Ooh. So I know there are uh, some people that I've talked to on the Big Island who, you know, they have young children that they, um, they don't put on the ground and um, have trouble finding opportunities to learn to crawl and walk because um, the ground has these stinging ants. Um, parents don't want their children moving around in areas that are infested with ants. So if anybody's watching and if you have them, who should they call? They can call uh, the Hawaii Ant Lab in Hilo. Uh, mm -hmm. They can also call, we have a statewide pest hotline, it's 643-PEST and uh, it connects to a phone tree, so depending on what island you're on when you call, it connects to a different set of experts that can best address your concern. All right, that's important, 643-PEST. Yes. yes, yep. Wow, I bet you get some interesting calls. Have you been getting any calls about snakes? I was a little worried recently, because they said in January that they there was some snakes here in Oahu. Right. Um, so do, do people call this number? Yep, yeah, this hotline okay. is also used for snake reports. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't get the calls personally, but I talk to the people who do. And yeah, they get snake reports every now and then. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes it's snake calls from harbor areas where cargo containers are brought in, uh, and snakes might be accidental stowaways with um, goods that are traded commercially. Mm -hmm. And then other times, um, snakes can be uh, released from homes where they're kept as pets illegally. Um, it's not legal to keep a snake as a pet in Hawaii, but sometimes people do anyway. So there's a $200,000 fine associated with that. And sometimes, um, you know, rather than being caught with that illegal animal, people will release it into the wild. Um, and so sometimes snake calls are Mm -hmm. from that. So these amnesty programs that we have are wonderful and I hope we continue to have them because we don't want to discourage people. I mean, you know, a pet, you know, when you have a pet and you get attached to your pet, I can understand people loving their pet and you don't want to leave it behind. But the reality is, is our environment will not tolerate a new species like that because our environment, the animals in our environment do not know how to deal with it. So when a snake comes up, it's like, hello, you know, right. instead of running away, you know, so it's very dangerous. And I've been following what's happening in the Everglades in Florida, and mm -hmm. I'm astonished how the Burmese python, the pythons, and they're just going across the whole southeast of the United States. They are prolific, and they're killing off, you know, like the albatross is almost totally wiped out in the Everglades. And there's other species that everybody, they were always in the Everglades. And they're almost like 1% of the population is left because the pythons have them for lunch and dinner and, right. you know, snacks. And, and the things. ecological impacts would be similar here. There's no natural predator for snakes in Hawaii. Um, so if snakes were able to establish here, they would be able to reproduce without that natural um, balance on their population size. So they would do really well, um, and then the impacts to, say, our native bird populations would be um, devastating because you have this large snake population, it needs a food source. It's going to look to things like native birds um, to provide food. So this issue um, happened in Guam uh, after the Second World War. Brown tree snakes were introduced to Guam through some military cargo, most likely. And um, there were, I believe, um, 14 species of endemic um, bird species that were native to Guam. And now there's something like two that are left uh, in the wild because the brown tree snake has reproduced unchecked. Um, it's all through the forest. And so it can eat um, bird eggs, whether they're on the ground or up in trees. And so the native bird population has been devastated. So if you go into the Guam forest at night, rather than hearing bird calls, you hear silence. 
um, after uh, it had decimated the bird population, the snakes moved on to amphibians, and it has um, reduced the amphibian population there, which in turn has uh, increased the insect population because you don't have the amphibians to control them. So the uh, forest in Guam has a lot of bugs uh, and no birds and few amphibians. So it's really um, interesting to walk through and to think how different it must have been just 60 years ago and to think that that's what could happen to Hawaii if we had an introduction of um, brown tree snakes here. Mm -hmm. So with the time we have left, see I told you it was going to go fast. Sure. <laughs> with the time we have left, um, I think it's imperative that we talk about what can we do to make sure there's enough funding, there's enough partnerships, there's enough collaboration, there's enough of us working on this because I don't really want to see what happened to Guam happen to Hawaii. So, you know, here's, you know, talk to us. You know, you got a minute and sure. a little over a minute saying why we need to, to do this. So conservation funding in Hawaii uh, has always been uh, difficult to come by, even in uh, the good economic times. And the reality is that um, people come to Hawaii because it's naturally beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the great assets of this state but we're not investing in protecting that environment. Um, so currently uh, there are some bills in the um, legislative session this year that would provide funding for watershed protection, including uh, mitigating invasive species in watershed areas. Those funds would go into the Natural Area Reserve Fund, uh, which is administered by uh, the Department of Land and Natural Resources for protecting uh, priority watershed areas and uh, other high uh, conservation value habitats in Hawaii. So um, anything that people see uh, in the ledge session that can provide funds for conservation um, always helps. And contacting legislators to make sure that um, your legislative um, senators and representatives know that the environment is an important issue to you, that's something that people can do to really make a difference. Really, and, and I think that, you know, clearly government plays a role in many areas, but I would say, you know, besides public education, besides our prisons, other things that we take for granted with government. Clearly, this issue of tackling invasive species, I see as a government function, very well coordinated. And you know, I hope the public, you know, it's really a challenge for us. And I hope the public works with us to try to figure out how to fund, how to make sure that we tackle these problems so that we keep the environment, you know, the way we love it currently today and for future generations. You know, we really have to tackle it or we're going to end up with, you know, not being able to go out on the beach because we've got fire ants, you know, and so it's, exactly. it's a big deal. Yep. But thank you for coming today. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was great. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us and take care and aloha.